When I Should Be So Lucky hit number one on the British Singles Chart back in 1988, Kylie Minogue became an instant international sensation. Two decades later, she was a guest at her own costume exhibition at Britain's prestigious Victoria and Albert Museum. Taking in the many milestones and phases of her first 20 years in the music business, she couldn't help but be impressed. I've been busy. And while some of the members of the British art establishment had raised eyebrows at the V&A's decision to lower itself to the glorification of pop music, Kylie, the exhibition's curator, was quick to justify the retrospective. She is without a doubt an icon of um, popular contemporary culture and you see through the exhibition that she's somebody who's always changed her image through the 20 or so years that she's, she's, she's been in the forefront and that she's not afraid of making mistakes and that she is fantastically professional and hard-working. The exhibition stretched memories all the way back to the image that brought Kylie to fame in the mid-80s, as Charlene the Mechanic in Neighbours. When her singing career took off in 1988, she ditched the overalls and left the show, along with her on- and off-screen partner Jason Donovan. The sugary pop songs, muslin dresses, curly hair and girly videos of her early pop career neatly extended the girl next door image she crafted on Neighbours. Her real life romance with Jason also helped keep the spirit of Charlene alive. As well as recording the number one duet, especially for you, Kylie and Jason sang together on the 1989 version of the Band-Aid single, Do They Know It's Christmas. Always friendly with the press and her fans, Smiley Kylie became a favourite on daytime children's shows. But even at the tender age of 21, she showed a mature appreciation of the team supporting her as an artist. People forget that everyone inside the building, the TV crews, the, the you know, just everyone involved is putting in their time and, and willing to help, which is great. That appreciation of support and collaboration was to take on increasing significance as she began to test her wings. And back in 1989, she needed all the help she could get in the next stage of her metamorphosis. From family-friendly teen queen to sexy siren, a poorly received role in the film The Delinquents may have added a little raunch to her image, but it was her next romance with sultry in excess frontman Michael Hutchins that really made the difference. Towards the end of 1991, her growing confidence was pivotal in her decision not to renew her contract with Pete Waterman Limited. I don't think you're meant to, to leave that kind of hit factory and I don't think anyone else did, so it, yeah, it was hard. Once again, she acknowledged she couldn't have done it alone. I, I put a lot of it down to luck. Um, and the fact that the public were, were very, um, well, yeah, as open as possible to me changing and doing different things, and I, I will be eternally thankful for that. Kylie's self-titled album received mixed reviews, but it signalled her determination to take more control over her music and exploit her sexuality. The video to Confide in Me featured her engaging in phone sex while she performed a slow strip tease in the Barbarella inspired Put Yourself in My Place. Her next step was to get in touch with her inner rock chick in time for the 1998 release of Impossible Princess. Instead of the music, the press fixated on her change of image. I think people think we sit around at a big board meeting and say, right, we're going to completely change you this time, what will we do? But for Kylie, the constant evolution was just a natural part of growing up. I think people, you know, if they have a snapshot of me in their mind from, be it 10 years ago or three years ago, um, I'm bound to change. At 30 years old and in the next phase in her evolving career, Kylie was still getting the thumbs up from her loyal fans.
She's just brilliant. All her records are brilliant. She's brilliant. She's so nice. The songs are catchy and they're nice to dance to. I just think she's beautiful. She's improving every day. Like She's not getting worse, that's for sure. The pop princess was finally breaking free from the restrictions that had governed her earlier output. <laughs> Finally, six years after breaking away from Stock Aitken and Waterman, Kylie from Camberwell was giving herself permission to experiment with different styles and develop her songwriting. But after Impossible Princess became the lowest selling album of her career, she was forced to reevaluate her strengths. I learned a bit of a lesson in the last couple of years about what I do best. I started out doing pop and I think that's what I'm definitely what I'm going to do next. Her no holds barred exercise in pushing the boundaries had taught her that even she had her limits. I think she's uh, moved on from the like the soap star image, but it'll always be there to haunt her. Having accepted that she could take the girl out of neighbours but would never fully escape Charlene, she wasted no time in bouncing back. In April 1999, she signed a new deal with Parlophone Records, and by the year 2000, a revamp of 70s disco was soaring up the charts. Light Years went on to sell 2 million copies worldwide, and New Musical Express wrote, Kylie's capacity for reinvention is staggering, and declared the album sheer joy. Its debut single, Spinning Around, delivered her first number one single in the UK for 10 years. The latest incarnation of Kylie Minogue was all about sex and sophistication, and it was working like a charm. Her 2001 album, Fever, mixed the disco feel of light years with the retro sounds of 80s electro pop. I feel with this album, it, it's the most cohesive project I've done musically, visually, um, my, the amount of Kylie, I suppose, that's in it. Um, it, it just all seemed to work. It was really easy to record. Barely had the album been pressed, and she was already thinking about her next move. I, I have had a, a growing desire in the past couple of years to get back into acting. I think I must have recovered from the really bad movies that I did enough to think, hmm, OK, I think I can go in and do something that, that, uh, that I can be proud of. However, she had to put thoughts of a return to acting on hold when, after 14 years of knocking on America's door, she was finally welcomed with open arms on the back of the lead single, Can't Get You Out of My Head, which reached number one on the dance club charts. She was swamped at record store signings on her promotional tour and displayed the same approachability and friendliness towards the fans and press that had characterized her public appearances from the start. And she'd lost none of her girl next door humility. For, for many years I've just thought, oh, the States is a, a place I'm not going to work, I'll just come for vacations and I was quite content with that. But I did always give myself a uh, Kind of an escape clause and I said that if I if you know by miracle if I ever had a song that started to take off then I would come and follow it up. At the age of 34 when most pop stars are thinking about retiring Kylie was just hitting her stride. Scooping more awards than ever before not only was she being recognized by the usual roll call of mainstream pop honors like the Brit Awards and Smash Hits she was also earning accolades from the more serious music journos over at NME, who had previously dismissed Kylie as a pop lightweight. For readers of NME to, to have um, taken note of what I'm doing and, and to, to like it and to bother to vote is, is amazing. Now in her mid-30s, it was time to trade in the sizzling sex kitten image for a more mature, sultry one. And Kylie turned to her treasured stylist, William Baker, to help craft the Bridget Bardot-inspired look, which launched her ninth studio album, Body Language. A change in direction that was also reflected in her music. I think it's, it's indicative of, of pop music today. You can't really separate 
your image from your music. So I think it works. I think it just reflects me being a 35-year-old woman. The, the tempo's down. There's been a few people that, that hear the album and go, OK, so where's the big, you know, n -s -n -s -n club songs? And there really isn't any of those, but you can move to them. And in a frank interview to promote the album, she tackled the topic of her overtly sexual image. Part of what I've grown up with, the icons of mine when I w was younger, were glamorous, sexy women. And I really, uh, I, I don't think of myself that way. I go home and stilettos come off and slippers go on and I'm really not very <laughs> glamorous at all. So it's, it's like role play and it's something that I, I'm certainly not ashamed of. I try and have fun with it. She did admit, however, that her approach to performing had changed over the years. I think when I was younger, my voice was, was the last thing I considered, and now it's the first thing. The choreography, the special effects, love it, love you all, great. But guys, I've got to sing, so let's make that the priority. Everything's changed for me. The way that I would, I, I would perform older songs and perform them differently now. It's inevitable, I think. It's inevitable, and on top of that, I, I've tried my hardest to, to better myself and to do my job as well as I can. While the album didn't go on to repeat the sell success of Fever, it marked yet another successful transformation for the constantly evolving pop princess. The release of her greatest hits package, Ultimate Kylie, the following year, took her tally of top 10 singles up to 29 and made her the second most successful woman on the British charts behind fellow chameleon Madonna. <laughs> Wide of the mark rumours about Kylie's private life had become so commonplace since she shot to fame in the late 80s that when news broke that she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2005, it was met with scepticism. Nobody was willing to believe that little Kylie had been struck down by such a life-threatening disease at just 37 years of age. As the news began to sink in, it stunned her peers and fans alike, especially at home in Australia. Her sister Danny jumped on the next flight to Melbourne and messages of support flooded in. She's you know, an Australian icon and she represents Australia all over the world, so I'm sure that she's a bit of you know, one of Australia's golden girls, so I think everybody would be wishing her well. She was forced to cancel the Australian leg of her showgirl tour and underwent surgery to remove the tumour later in May. She then headed to Paris for further treatment. After undergoing chemotherapy, photos of her sporting headscarves and a cropped hairdo made the rounds in various news bulletins and gossip magazines around the world. Even while undergoing treatment, she was determined not to pass up the opportunity to use her profile to promote awareness of breast cancer won her great admiration from breast cancer campaigners. In early 2006, reports began to emerge of her improving health, and in June, she appeared on stage unannounced at one of her sister Danny's concerts, to the hysterical delight of fans, one of whom managed to record the moment on his mobile phone camera. Absolutely shocked. Everybody was just like, oh my God, it's Kylie. Two months later, she was doing it for the kids at a packed-out London bookstore. Looking radiant, she was overjoyed to have finally fulfilled her father Ron's prophecy. My dad will love this. <laughs> He's always said, one day you're going to write children's book. I know that sounds impossible, but that's I, I remember that from being a child. For the showgirl princess herself, it was a major milestone in an extraordinary life she would never take for granted again. I think everything I'm doing at the moment feels slightly monumental because because I'm here and it's happening so then it was down to the serious business of getting back on stage for her first concert since her illness ahead of the gig at the Sydney Entertainment Centre her loyal fans were proving the depth of their devotion 
Very excited to see Kylie. Fanatical fan. Yes. Crazy. So in I actually went ago. to the last show in London that she did, and now I'm going to the first show after her illness, so it's quite exciting. The sellout extravaganza was declared nothing less than a triumph by the Sydney Morning Herald, and fans were beside themselves. It was, it was amazing. amazing. She's so beautiful. Oh, Kylie's my princess. <laughs> she was. It was amazing. It was really. It was really worth the wait. And she was really good. Everything was better, and the costumes were better, and she was better, and I loved it. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Awesome. Was it? Kylie's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. 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 Since then, she's released a tenth studio album, aptly entitled X, as well as featuring in a documentary of her comeback called White Diamond and the Bollywood film Blue. <laughs> Aside from pumping out more than two decades worth of hits and staging ten world tours, Kylie has also been blazing a trail as a celebrity entrepreneur. In 2003, she took to the stage with four scantily clad models at the London launch of her Love Kylie lingerie line. Well, it started about almost four years ago. Um, uh, Holeproof, which is a manufacturing company in Australia, asked me if I would like to be the face of another one of their ranges. And uh, I said, well, no, frankly, <laughs> but I would like my own range, which stems from just a genuine love of lingerie. The range boasted plenty of delicate ribbon detailing, pretty trinkets and crystals. Every style in the line was personally approved to make sure each item was perfect. Each piece also bore Kylie's signature. Love Kylie was all about making sexy underwear affordable and ensuring that a girl could pick out a different style for every day of the week. Kylie herself has been quoted as saying, the lingerie is like shoes and diamonds. A girl just can't have too many knickers and bras. And you can go down the high street these days and you can very affordably buy a look that you feel like on that particular day. So I wanted the, um, the range to reflect that. You can, and there's different names for the different styles. You have Fever, Envy, Vamp. Um, you know, if you're feeling girly or flirtatious or you're out on a hot date, you can kind of take your pick. At the launch of her new hosiery range, LK Legs, a year later, she was well covered up leaving a string of underwear models to brave the probing telephoto lenses. There were foxy fishnets and peekaboo suspenders on display, as well as new bras and knickers from the Love Kylie range. And Kylie wasn't about to stop there. The next phase in Kylie's entrepreneurial development was the release of her own perfume. She launched Darling in Australia on the eve of her rescheduled showgirl tour in late 2006. It was so much fun to work on something that wasn't music, that, that was its own. We all worked really hard to create something that didn't look like an album cover, um, that mm. had its own, uh, its own sense, its own, um, its own space. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun. The following year, she was asked to put her name to a beachwear line for Swedish retailer H&M and ended up performing at the launch of their first store in mainland China. Then it was time to deliver on her promise to branch out into the realms of home furnishings with the launch of At Home with Kylie. I've always loved fabrics and I guess that's part of fashion and my love of fashion. Um, and I, I, when we had our, our design meetings, I uh, firstly I invited the team to my home, as it's called Kylie at home. Come to my home, see what my living space is like. You might even notice things that I kind of take for granted. Um, and I pulled out all these bits of fabric and trims and this and that that I'd kept for, literally for 20 years. So it does go back that far. And so I've been um, I've been vindicated. The stuff that I've been hoarding has <laughs> finally got a purpose. 
The range she designed with William Baker features bed linen, towels, curtains, cushions and throws in organza, silks and taffetas. And as you'd expect from the range, it's lathered in sequins, diamantes and semi-precious stones. Over the course of her glittering career, Kylie has become a multi-millionaire and won numerous awards, as well as being honoured with an OBE and a Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters. She's also the only person besides the Queen of England who can lay claim to having four wax figures displayed in the iconic Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in London. Despite all the achievements and accolades, however, there seems to be no escape from the recurring questions about the romantic future of a pop princess who's taken a while to find her prince charming. I, I'm, a, I'm a fatalist and I've been lucky enough to, to have some great relationships. And I've always believed they run the time they're meant to run, so we'll see what's around the corner for me. Way back in 1988, while she was storming up the British charts with I Should Be So Lucky, she was enjoying a highly publicised relationship with her former neighbour's co-star, Jason Donovan. However, fans hoping for a real-life repeat of their neighbour's wedding were to be sorely disappointed. By the end of the year, Kylie had fallen for the seductive charms of sultry in excess frontman Michael Hutchins, reportedly leaving poor Jason heartbroken. The much older and more experienced Michael was credited with helping transform Kylie from bubblegum pop queen to sexy temptress. Michael once joked that his favourite hobby was corrupting Kylie, for whom he wrote Suicide Blonde. Meanwhile, she was so smitten by the new man in her life, she began hinting in interviews that she wouldn't mind being proposed to. Again, however, there were to be no wedding bells. In 1991, as Kylie was embarking on a new deal with Deconstruction Records, Michael was embarking on an affair with model Helena Christensen. Despite the sad end to their relationship, she remained friends with Michael until his tragic death in Sydney in 1997. Then came her longest lasting relationship to date with model James Gooding. Sadly, it came to an acrimonious end with James blabbing to the press about the string of high-profile affairs he'd indulged in while he'd been with Kylie. In Paris with her next boyfriend, Olivier Martinez, Kylie was clearly well on the way to mending her broken heart. Although that relationship was also dogged by rumours of infidelity, Olivier came through strongly by looking after Kylie throughout her battle with breast cancer in 2005. Then, in February 2007, as she prepared to launch an exhibition of her costumes at London's v &A Museum, came the news that it was all over with Olivier. And with Kylie fast approaching the end of her 30s, she had to keep fielding questions about when she would settle down. I'm asked a lot about that at the moment, and uh, I can only say very generally that a family in the future would be wonderful. Um, I don't think it's something that I can necessarily plan, <laughs> but if that were to happen, you know, that would, my life would go on a brand new uh, path and I think it would be fantastic. Now deeply involved with Spanish model and Olivier lookalike Andre Valencozo, bets are on as to whether the pop princess will finally make it down the aisle. Thank <laughs> you.